This, this is Saurabh, and, and you're listening to my favorite talk show, The BG show, show with Aditya. Change may be the only constant, but one constant that hasn't changed over the past 180 days is the continuous repetition of two ingrates repeating. The COVID-19 pandemic has thrown our normal lives completely out of gear and made us relook at how we structure our lives. Clients may have impressed people a few months ago, but now they just seem like repeating on a loop. Nobody is impressed by the continuous repetition of these lines and I am definitely not impressed by a few individuals who are so hungry for publicity, who have ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder, and just to get their names in the electronic print and other forms of media, they have to keep repeating such lines. This constant discourse around how we have to restructure our lives, how we have to be spent trips anymore. All this is nothing more than a paradox and the hypocrisy of the human race. Such reiterations don't count as any concern, but nothing more than ADD, attention deficit disorder. That is what we all crave for. I had been influenced by such ADD individuals then I wouldn't have completed 275 episodes today. That is the 19th of October 2020. While the need to wear masks has some logic and the campaign around it makes sense. But the extreme side of assumption that before whatever happened over the past six months, individuals were not engaged in hygiene, that is people were not their hands with soap and water or the constant reminder of using some kind of alcohol soap. This reeks of hypocrisy. But we are here to celebrate episode number 275 of the greatest talk show in the galaxy. I read in newspapers that organizations which are slowly opening like the metro services or the cinema halls their staff is now disinfecting those premises after every movie or enough trains have been run on that route. It doesn't impress me. What are they trying to prove? Nothing. But then that's the way humanity can easily be manipulated because we are malleable beings. That is why scare tactics work. When you read on pseudo media and print and electronic media that don't go out because you are in danger of being infected. Whether it actually happens or not is a totally different story. But the scare tactics have worked like a charm. And now 275 episodes in the year 2020 means we have reached almost to the end of the year. We are in month of October, which means that milestone episodes have been celebrated in large numbers this year, starting from the 150th episode on 1st of January to the 175th episode on the 28th of February to the 200th on the 27th of April and so on and so forth and finally the 275th episode celebrated tonight on the 19th of October 2020. Human beings are like sheep. They need to be shepherded and they need to be in a closeted safe environment. This discourse around hand hygiene doesn't impress me. Everybody knows that you have to wash your hands. But then like Pavlov's experiment, we don't do something until the bell rings. Then humanity's innate nature is to go 
bananas and make a mountain out of a mole hill. A few pseudo experts think that they are being smart by constantly reminding us of clean infected surfaces. Well, isn't that obvious? Everybody knows we have to clean up after we have done some activity. That is but obvious. That is but innate human nature. Just because something has happened, but pretending to disinfect surfaces and our hands. Everybody knows that has to be done. It's a natural thing. It will be done whether this thing had come or not. A malleable mind. Humans need to see it is done. So these organizations who were doing that very thing of cleaning surfaces like the cinema halls after a show is complete or metro trains after the train has incurred a couple of rides. They were doing it and showed but because now people are afraid that is why it has forced these organizations to show everything in public. These things are supposed to be done quietly not in public but the only difference that has happened over the past six months is that we think they were not doing it. To placate a few half-wits who are easily malleable, they have to show that we are cleaning in public, release photos of something that is not even supposed to be a concern of the customers. That is between the management and the cleaning service. But whether it's to placate a few chuckle heads or to say that we are concerned about your hygiene, my only concern is to celebrate episode number 275, the greatest talk show in the entire galaxy. In contrast to the narrative created around the idea of an obvious thing called hygiene. It's getting a little boring now. Because it was a universal truth that Indian movies are bereft of ideas. They are just what one in Hindi calls a bangan ka bharta and a masala. A bharta of two, three movies plagiarized in the most demeaning form. But now this narrative and the script around the idea of hygiene, it's becoming as boring as an Indian movie which is usually plagiarized from 2-3 movies. This narrative doesn't impress me any more. Reading Session 1 Agatha Christie Labors of Hercules Chapter 1 Poirot murmured You did not approve of paying such a sum. Naturally, of course I didn't or wouldn't have if I had known anything about it. Millie, my wife, knew that well enough. She didn't say anything to me, just sent off the money in one pound notes as stipulated to the address given. And the dog was returned? Yes. That evening the bell rang and there was the little brute sitting on the doorstep and not a soul to be seen. Perfectly. Continue. Then, of course, Millie confessed what she had done and I lost my temper a bit. However, I calmed down after a while. After all, the thing was done and you can't expect a woman to behave with any sense and I dare say I should have let the whole thing go if it hadn't been for meeting old Samuelson at the club. Yes, damn it all, this thing must be a positive racket. Exactly the same thing had happened to him. 300 pounds they had ripped his wife off. Well, that was a bit too much. I decided the thing had got to be stopped. I sent for you. But surely, Sir Joseph, the proper thing and a very much more inexpensive thing would have been to send for the police. But Joseph rubbed his nose. He said, 
Are you married, Mr. Poirot? Alas, said Poirot, I have not that felicity. <laughs> said Sir Joseph, don't know about felicity, but if you were, you would know that women are funny creatures. My wife went into hysterics at the mere mention of the police. She had got into her head that something would happen to her precious Shan Tung. I went her of the idea and I may say she doesn't take very kindly to the idea of your being called in. But I stood firm there and at last she gave way. But mind you, she doesn't like it. Hercule Poirot murmured, the position is, I perceive, a delicate one. It would be as well, perhaps, if I were to interview Madame, your wife, and gain further particulars from her whilst at the same time reassuring as to the future safety of her dog. Sir Joseph nodded and rose to his feet. He said, I'll take you along in the car right away. Wedding Session 2, Homer Iliad Book 2 So much for his plan. Agamemnon took his seat and Nestor rose among them. Noble Nestor, the king of Palos' Sandy Harbor, spoke and urged them on with all good will. Friends, lords of the Argives, O oh my captains, if any other Achaean had told us of this dream, we'd call it false and turn our backs upon it. But look, the man who saw it has every claim to be the best, the bravest Achaean we can feel. Come, see if we can arm the Achaeans for assault. And out he marched, leading the way from council. The rest sprang to their feet, the sceptered kings obeyed the great field marshal. Rank and file streamed behind and rushed like swarms of bees pouring out of a rocky hollow, burst on endless burst, bunched in clusters, seeding over the first spring blooms. Dark hordes swirling into the air, this way, that way, so the many armed Platoons from the ships and tents came marching on, close file along the deep wide beach to crowd the meeting grounds and rumors. Zeus's crier, like wild fire blazing among them, whipped them on. The troops assembled, the meeting ground shook. The earth groaned and rumbled under the huge weight as soldiers took positions, the whole place in uproar. Nine heralds shouted out, trying to keep some order. Quiet battalions, silence, hear your royal kings. The men were as seeds marshaled into ranks, the shouting died away, silence. King Agamemnon rose to his feet, raising high in hand the scepter. Hephaestus made with all his strength and skill. Hephaestus gave it to Cronus' son, Father Zeus, and Zeus gave it to Hermes, the giant killing guide, and Hermes gave it to Pelops, that fine charioteer. Pelops gave it to Atreus, marshal of fighting men, who died and passed it on to Thaestes, rich in flocks, and he in turn bestowed it on Agamemnon to bear on high as he ruled his many islands and lauded mainland Argos. Now, leaning his weight upon that kingly scepter, Atreus declared his will to all Achaea's armies. Friends, Fighting Danans, aids in arms of aids. Cronus' son has trapped me in madness, blinding ruin. Zeus is a harsh, cruel god. He woke to me long ago, 
He bowed his head that I should never embark for whom I had brought the walls of Ilium crashing down. But now I see he only plotted brutal treachery. Now he commands me back to Argos in disgrace. Whole regiments of my men destroyed in battle. So it must please his overweening heart. Who knows? Father Zeus has looted the crowns of a thousand cities. True, and Zeus will look still more. His power is too great. What humiliation! Even for generations still to come, to learn that Achaean armies so strong, so vast, fought a futile war. We are still fighting it. No end in sight, and battling forces we outnumber by far. Say that Trojans and Achaeans both agreed to swear a truce to seal their oaths in blood. And opposing sides were tallied out in full. Count one by one the Trojans who live in Troy, but count our Achaeans out by ten man squads, and each squad pick a Trojan to pour its wine. Many Achaean tents would lack their steward then. Reading session three. P.G. Woodhouse, stiff upper lip, Jeeves. No more than the sight of him does to me. I reposted warmly. I resented the suggestion that I had nothing better to do with my time than fraternize with ex-magistrates. Certainly, I'll avoid his society. It will be a pleasure. Is that all? That's all. Then I'll be getting back to Gussie. I said and was starting to move off when Stiffy uttered a sharp squeak. Gussie, that reminds me. There's something I wanted to tell him, something of vital concern to him, and I can't think how it slipped my mind. See, she called, and Gussie, seeming to wake abruptly from a daydream, blinked and came over. What are you doing, hanging about here, Gussie? Who me? I was discussing something with Bertie, and he said he'd be back when at liberty to go to it further. Well, let me tell you that you have no time for discussing things with Bertie. Oh, uh, or for saying, oh, uh, I met Broderick just now, and he asked me if I knew where you were because he wants to tear you limb. From Lim to his having seen you kiss the cook, Gussie's jaw fell with a dull thud. You never told me. He said that to me, and one spotted the note of reproach in his voice. No, sorry, I forgot to mention it, but it's true. You'd better start coping. Run like a hare is my advice. He took it. Standing not on the order of his going, as the fellow said, he dashed off as if shot from a gun, and was making excellent time when he was brought up short by colliding with Spood, who had at that moment entered left center. Always disconcerting to have even as small a chap as Gussie take you squarely in the midriff, as I myself can testify. Having had the same experience down in Washington Square during a visit to New York, Washington Square is bountifully supplied with sad-eyed Italian kids who whiz to and fro on roller skates, and one of them, proceeding on his way with lowered head, rammed me in the neighborhood of the third waistcoat button at a high rate of miles per hour. It gave me a strange "Where am I?" feeling, and I imagine Spood's sensations were somewhat similar. His breath escaped him in a sharp "Oof!" and he swayed like some forest tree beneath the woodman's axe. But unfortunately, Gussie had paused to sway too, and this gave him time to steady himself 
on even keel and regroup his forces reaching out a hand like hand he attached it to the scruff of gussie's neck and said ha ha is one of those things it's never easy to find the right reply to it resembles you in that respect but gussie was saved the necessity of searching for words by the fact that he was being shaken like a cocktail in a manner that precluded speech if precluded is the word i want his spectacles fell off and came to rest near where i was standing i picked them up with a view to returning them to him when he had need of them which i could see would not be immediately as this fink nottle was a boyhood friend with whom as i have said i had frequently shared my last bar of milk chocolate and as it was plain that if someone didn't intervene pretty soon he was in danger of having all his internal organs shaken into some sort of macedon or hash the thought of taking some steps to put an end to this distressing scene naturally crossed my mind for more awesome content tune in to the next episode of the weekly show with aditya